For our study of adverse selection, we're going to uh, work on a version of Akerlof's model applied to a labor market. Now, there are many uh, ways in which we could apply Akerlof's ideas, the original being the secondhand car market, also uh, credit markets, or indeed any, any um, market where we have a good, where there is some uncertainty about its quality and there could be asymmetric information about that quality so one uh, player knows whether it's a good or bad quality object and the other players who are buying the objects don't know. We're going to think about a labour market uh, and have the idea that um, each individual worker knows whether they are able to produce a lot for the firm or whether they are not very good at producing money for the firm. Uh, but there is there will be asymmetric information at some point uh, where even though the workers know their own productivity, the firms can't tell the difference between these workers. So we'll start by looking at perfect information before moving on to asymmetric information. So let's introduce our simple model of a labour market. So in our model of the labour market, we're going to assume that there are many identical firms producing the same output. Essentially, this will amounts to an assumption of competitive behavior because there are many identical firms competing uh, in their demands for employing labor. No single firm will be able to determine the market wage. So everybody will take that market wage as given. We're going to assume for simplicity that there is constant returns to scale and the price of output is normalized to one. Essentially, this will mean um, that when uh, you employ um, a unit of labor, they produce something, then that is equal to the money that they produce. Um, so it makes things simple. Okay. Now, uh, don't be put off by the fact that we're making this model very simple. Okay. If we make a model that's very simple, it should behave very well. So when we see bad results later on, hopefully they're even more, um, they, they have even more impact because the model is so simple. Um, now, we're going to assume that workers have different productivity levels and we'll, we'll refer to what's called a worker's type, okay? Now, when we studied choice under uncertainty or the model of uncertainty in lecture one, we used the word state to, as uh, saying, well, if we know the state, then we can describe the world perfectly. Um, it's common in economics and game theory when we're talking about an, an individual a decision maker rather than just describing the world we use type so you could think of this as state a description of a of a worker leaving no uncertainty resolved if we know the worker's type then we know everything relevant about that worker for us the worker's type will be some number theta which belongs to an interval uh theta underline to overline theta okay where underline theta is less than overline theta and they're both positive and uh, finite so what does this mean essentially a worker of type theta is able to produce theta units of output of course if these sell at a price of equal to one then that is their revenue as well okay so each type of worker has a, a specific number, theta, and that's the amount of money that they can make the firm if they get employed. OK, so this is how the revenue side will work. The cost side is essentially each individual has to be paid a wage W. And because it's a competitive market, nobody can affect this wage. Everybody takes the wage as given and will denote the wage as W. We have assumed that types in this labor market, so productivity types, the ability of each worker to generate revenue for the firm, is a number theta for each worker that belongs to an interval underline theta up to overline theta. Okay, so there's many different types. Uh, and what we're going to assume for the sake of simplicity in this lecture is that types are uniformly distributed on that interval okay so so every different type is in a sense equally likely uh, this is just for simplicity 
Um, now, whatever we assume about the distribution, we're going to assume it's a uniform distribution. But whatever assumption you make about the, distri the distribution, you always assume that firms at least know the distribution of types. Okay, so firms know precisely um, that types are uniformly distributed and they know the interval of possible values. They know the support of that distribution. Now, a key idea that we'll use is called the reservation wage. OK, so this is in a sense captures the idea of opportunity cost. These workers do, are not being forced to work for any firm and they may well have another offer somewhere else. We're going to assume that this reservation wage depends on their type. So um, if I'm type theta, then I can produce theta amount of revenue for the firm if I'm employed. Well, then R of theta, my reservation wage, plugging into this reservation wage function, R of theta, uh, tells me um, how much money I've been offered elsewhere, essentially. So it's my, set, it's my alternative offer, my opportunity cost. What's the implication of this? Well, if I'm a worker of type theta, that's the amount of money I can make for the firm, then when the market wage is announced, W, if W is greater than or equal to my reservation wage, which depends on my type, then I will accept employment and go and work for this firm. If the wage is less than my reservation wage, then I will go and work elsewhere. So we won't model exactly where they go. We'll just say that they are unemployed or they do not accept employment in this, in this particular market. OK, so that's the very simple model. We have uh, many identical firms. Of course, firms are profit maximizers, risk neutral profit maximizers, to be more specifically. Uh, they maximize expected profits. And we have on the supply side um, a whole interval of possible types of workers. Uh, and these types denote how much money that they can make for the firm or their productivity. And um, these are uniformly distributed. These types are uniformly distributed on an interval from underlying theta up to overlying theta. So let's first consider the case of perfect information. So what do I mean by perfect information in this market? Well, I mean that all the different types are identifiable. OK, so every different type is in its own information set. The firm can look at any particular worker and know that exactly what value of theta that worker has. OK, so how what would the equilibrium of this market be? Well, it's very simple. In a, in a competitive equilibrium, um, we have a lot of competition um, from firms demanding labor. And so if any firm is making profit, there is pressure for other firms to step in and offer lower wages, perhaps through some mechanism. However this works, there will always be pressure if firms make profits to drive that wage down. And so in a competitive equilibrium, we expect firms to earn zero profits. We expect the wage to adjust until firms earn zero profits. OK, now, because each type is identifiable, every type of worker here is different. It's perfectly reasonable for every type of worker to be paid a different amount. So we could imagine an equilibrium wage W star that depends on their type theta. OK, so if and the equilibrium condition for zero profits would be, well, every single uh, type theta is paid a wage W star of theta precisely equal to the money that they can make the firm. OK, so um, each worker is paid precisely the amount of money that they that they uh, generate for the firm. Firms then earn zero profits. And then how many workers would be employed in this economy? Well, it would essentially be all of the workers who are willing to accept a wage which is equal to the amount of um, of money that they generate for the firm. 
So the equilibrium set of employed workers would be capital theta star, which is a set of all of the different theta types with the property that the, their, um, their reservation wage does not exceed the amount of money that they are going to make and hence get paid. In particular, um, if we had a condition that said, well, no single type of worker is asking for more money than they actually generate for the firm. So if R of theta is less than theta for all theta, then in this uh, economy with perfect information, we would have full employment. Everybody would get employed and everybody would be paid a wage equal to the amount of money that they generate for their firm. So now that we've covered the introduction to our simple labour market model and we know what the equilibrium would be under perfect information, let's now think about asymmetric information. So in the rest of the video, I'll introduce the idea of how we model asymmetric information here and the definition of asymmetric, of a competitive equilibrium under uh, asymmetric information. And in the next video, I'll cover some more specific examples to show you what happens in different cases. So how do we model asymmetric information? Well, the assumption here will be that each worker knows their own type. OK, so each worker knows how much money they can produce for the firm. However, we're going to imagine as far as the firm is concerned, all types look the same. So uh, essentially, they are all contained in the same information set. There is no way of distinguishing between the types which could uh, generate a high revenue or types which generate a low revenue. They simply look the same. So here's a bunch of smiling faces that all look the same. These are our workers. They're uh, all ready to uh, see what the market wage is to see whether they want to accept employment or not. So let's assume that this set of types here, capital theta, is uh, the set of all theta with uh, values between 20 and 80. So what is the expected uh, revenue if the firm were to employ all of these workers? OK, well, it would be halfway between 20 and 80. If we're assuming that types are uniformly distributed, um, then I would just say halfway between 20 and 80, that midpoint, which is equal to 50, would be expected revenue or expected productivity if all types are employed. Now suppose the market wage is announced. So here uh, I've, well, this fictional character, the Valrasian auctioneer, announces the wage in the market. Uh, he's a classy looking guy here with a monocle and uh, nobody can change this wage. OK, so he has this Mr. Invisible Hand has announced the market wage. Nobody can change it, but we all respond to it differently. So here we have three different uh, three different workers who I've, Id I've identified by red squares around them. And one of them saying I can do better than that. So for him, the reservation, his reservation wage exceeded 50 uh, and another guy saying nope. And another one saying not enough for me. So these three types that we've identified, 50 was not high enough to meet the reservation wage for their particular type. And they know their type. And so these simply leave the room. OK, these these workers go elsewhere and we're left with a a smaller group of workers who stayed in the room. So what can I say about this group of workers who stayed in the room, who are willing to accept employment when the market wage is 50? Well, I could describe this set mathematically as a set capital theta of 50. So the set of types available for work when the market wage is 50 will be all a set of all of the theta uh, that satisfy the condition, the reservation wage for that type is less than or equal to 50. OK, so who's left in the room? Everybody whose reservation wage was lower than 50, was uh, no greater than 50. 
they are willing to accept employment. So if I know this reservation wage function, this R of theta, then I can calculate the expected revenue conditional on this market wage, conditional on the idea that workers are willing to accept this wage. So if, for example, R of theta is equal to theta, so everybody's type, the money that they can generate for the firm, is precisely equal to their reservation wage. So that's a very simple assumption. Um, then what can I say? Who's left in the room? Okay, well, the types were originally between 20 and 80. Anybody who has a type above 50 and therefore has a reservation wage above 50 has left the room. So who is left? It's all of the types between 20 and 50. And if they're uniformly distributed on that interval, then right in the middle of 20 and 50 is 35. And so the expected revenue conditional on this uh, idea that reservation wage does not exceed uh, the market wage, uh, I can calculate the expected revenue equal to 35 in this case. So that's a very basic idea of how we're going to model and uh, capture asymmetric information here. Uh, but we're using an idea called rational expectations. Essentially, we're calculating expected revenue when the firm makes their expected revenue calculations. They're assuming that uh, the they're assuming that the supply side of the market behaves rationally. So they only stay in the room if they want to. OK, so even though I can't identify specific types, I can make an assumption to say, well, if these types behave rationally, then nobody in the room has a reservation wage above the current market wage. And so I can calculate a conditional expected uh, revenue based on that information. So let's go on paper now and develop these ideas. OK, so now let's discuss the case of asymmetric information and by asymmetric information in this case what we're going to assume is that um, individual workers know their own productivity but the firm has no way of distinguishing between different workers okay so um, essentially we're going to say uh, imagine that types are not, um, let's say, identifiable, identifiable, which means they all look the same, okay? Or, using the language from the first lecture, all the different types of workers are contained in the same information set, okay? So there is no way of telling the difference between any of the workers, but each of the workers knows their own type. So they have better information. OK, now the first implication of this is that under perfect information, when we can tell the difference between every type of worker, we can pay each worker a different wage. They are a different type of worker, so it's quite possible to set them a specific wage, identify who they are, identify their productivity, and pay them according to their uh, productivity. But now um, we can't do this. So there is essentially one wage for all um, types. So whatever your type is, you're going to have to take the same wage. Uh, let's denote this W. Everybody has to accept the same wage because there is no way that this wage can be conditioned on your type. That information is not available, okay? Now, this is even if you try to tell the firm your type, they just have no reason to believe you, okay? Obviously, if you were going to tell them your type, you would just tell them you're the most productive type that ever existed. So they have no reason to believe you. So this problem can't go away that um, that easily. Okay, so now that we've adapted the information assumption, what are the implications for this? Well, this in terms of supply, um, 
the decision is essentially essentially the same. Okay, so um, what would the rule be? Well, if I'm type theta, then I would say accept employment um, if and only if, so I'll put if and only if, um, my reservation wage, given that I know my type theta, is um, is not greater than the wage that's being offered. Okay, so as long as my reservation wage is below what's being offered, I'll accept employment. And that's the only time I accept employment. Otherwise, I reject employment. So we immediately can get the aggregate market supply. Um, let's call this capital theta that depends on the market wage. Okay, so this is going to be a set of all the different theta that satisfy the accept um, accept employment condition. The reservation wages of those types do not exceed the current market wage. Okay, the single wage that we all just have to accept. So immediately we know the market supply. Who is going to accept this wage? It's going to be all of these thetas that satisfy this condition. So let's think about the demand side of the market. Let's think about the firm, okay? Um, now, if the firm's going to calculate profits, then it needs to know its revenue. Um, so let's let mu w uh, denote expected um, productivity. Um, which is the same for us. Because we assumed constant returns to scale and we assumed that every unit of output is sold for a price of one, it was just a normalization, this is, this is just expected revenue, okay? So how could we do this? Well, we're going to assume something um, a bit more clever now. We're going to say, well, the firm, it might not be able to identify individual types, Okay, but if it got all of the types in the room, then when the market wage is announced, what it, the firm can observe or can anticipate is that everybody who left the room, everybody who refused to go to work once the market wage was announced, those were the people whose reservation wages exceeded the market wage. OK, so the firm is able to anticipate the behavior of the supply side of the market here. So when it forms an expectation about revenue, it can it can use this information and say, well, I've employed um, a set of people here and I know that everybody in this set accepted the market wage. So the expected productivity would be the expected value of theta, the expected productivity level, conditioning on the fact that I'm able to anticipate that those with very high reservation wages left the room, okay? So this would be an expression for expected revenue, okay? So it's or the revenue of each employee, in a sense, the average revenue, I suppose, uh, would be um, how much do I expect each theta in this group to produce conditional on the fact that I know there are people in this group um, that sorry that everybody in this group has a reservation wage that didn't exceed the market wage otherwise they wouldn't be here okay so now when we develop a notion of equilibrium we're actually going to um, define what's called a rational expectations equilibrium and this is the part that where rational expectations are involved okay essentially you can think that this is not quite in the same sense that macroeconomists talk about rational expectations uh, by which they mean uh, something about predicting the future based on the present um, here rational expectations means when the firm forms a, an expectation about how much money it's going to make it is anticipating the rational behavior of the supply side of the market. It knows that anybody who has come to work has done so because they wanted to, 
they behaved rationally. The people who didn't want to come to work uh, didn't have to. They left the room when the wage was higher than their reservation wage. So the conditions for a, an equilibrium, essentially it's the same that we, we normally expect. Markets clear is one condition, so supply equals demand, but we're not going to express it quite like that. Um, we, we also expect, because it's a competitive equilibrium, that expected profit um, is zero. Okay, so it, the firm is it, we expect competition to drive the wage down to the point where firms are not making um, strictly positive profit. The firms are just making zero profit. So essentially, this will be the revenue and the cost will be W. Okay, so uh, this equaling W will be one of our equilibrium conditions. Okay, so let's have a look at the definition of a competitive equilibrium of this labor market when we have asymmetric information. So now we're ready to formally define a competitive equilibrium under asymmetric information. So a competitive equilibrium under asymmetric information is described by two things, a capital theta star, a set of worker types, um, they are workers, they are employed by the firms, and a wage rate W star, such that two things occur simultaneously. So condition one is that on the supply side of the market, behavior is rational. Okay, it's as simple as that. The set of worker types who are, who are employed is all of the different theta whose reservation wage uh, that depends on their type theta does not exceed the market wage. So they are all willing to work. Okay. The second condition is a zero profit condition that we expect in a competitive equilibrium that says the equilibrium wage W star, so the cost of employing um, types on average, is equal to the expected uh, revenue where we're conditioning on the fact that we're only considering types of workers who belong to the set described in condition one okay so this embodies an idea of rational expectations when the firm is calculating expected productivity which is equal to expected revenue for us um, then it's saying it, it assumes that well only types who uh, did whose reservation wage were low enough okay so only types who want to be here uh, will actually come to work and so I can condition my expectation on that assumption uh, when I calculate the expected revenue and then W star has to equal um, so the cost has to equal this revenue okay um, so we can combine these two uh, equations together um, to give a, a very simple condition uh, that W star has to equal the expected uh, revenue conditional on the idea that the reservation wage does not exceed W star, okay? Now, this idea of rational expectations, um, you, you will have seen a similar idea before when you studied game theory. So notice here that conditions one and two are not entirely separate. They refer to each other. So I've identified a pink and blue uh, theta star and W star appear in both conditions. Now, if you remember the definition of a Nash equilibrium, that had the same kind of flavor where player one is best responding, giving his beliefs about the behavior of player two and simultaneously player two is best responding, given his beliefs about the behavior of player one. So each condition referred to each other. That's exactly the same as what's going on here. So this amounts to a kind of a, a, a very similar assumption regarding expectations about other players that is used in the game theory you would have seen before. In the next video, we'll, go, we'll use this uh, definition of a competitive equilibrium and we'll plug in some specific values for our um our distribution of worker types and um, and this make a specific assumptions about this reservation wage function and actually calculate um, two examples of 
competitive equilibria under asymmetric information.